Last week we talked about rekindling the faith, and today I want to say a few words about what that might look like. The Order of the White Feather. The Order of the White Feather was founded in 1914, just before the First World War, by Admiral Charles Fitzgerald. And this organization aimed at shaming men into enlisting in the British Army. And they did that by persuading women, particularly young women, to present them with a white feather if they were not wearing a uniform. The white fe feather, it went on to become a symbol of cowardice. And according to that renowned source of wisdom, Wikipedia, the symbol um, started in the cockfighting industry and the belief that a cockerel sporting a white feather in its tail was likely to be a bit of a coward and a poor fighter because pure great, purebred gamecocks don't have white feathers and so its presence indicated something that this wasn't a purebred, a bit inferior. And anyway, this white feather, it, the campaign in Britain certainly encouraged uh, quite a number of people to enlist in the war effort because the last thing that a young man wants to be called is a coward. Well, the Apostle Paul's young friend, Timothy, seems to have, in this letter we know as 2 Timothy, he seems to have stepped back from the fray associated with the gospel of Christ. And this mission that they had was not an easy mission because he and Paul and others had uh, incurred all manner of difficulty and Paul is in prison now facing death and, and Timothy is perhaps saying to himself, you know, enough is enough. I, I'm not sure I want this. I don't want imprisonment. I don't want jail. I don't want to suffer for this. And here... Paul's writing to Timothy, and he's exhorting him to return uh, and telling him about how important this message of Jesus' resurrection is. And uh, he encourages Timothy, as we said last time, to, to rekindle his faith with the Spirit. Because God, he says, did not give us a spirit of cowardice or timidity, but rather a spirit of power and love. And another word, which we will just let go for the time being, is with self-discipline. Power, love, self-discipline. Three things that the Spirit of God can bring into a life. As I contemplated this passage, it seemed to me these are three things that would perhaps help the mainline church today as it considers its place in the world. Now, to, to understand the full context of this and what Paul's getting at, we need to recognize that the whole context of Paul's letter is that the good news of Christ continue to go forth. Even if his life is taken, he hopes Timothy will continue. And he says the spirit that rekindles faith will provide him for, for, with all the tools that he needs. Power, love, and this word, which we'll translate for the time being, is self-discipline. Well, the first one is power. I want to tell you about a dog that I used to have, a large Labrador. And uh, Jay was his name. He was a very fine dog and a very attractive dog, top breeding stock. Um, and um, when I would take him for a walk, all sorts of people would comment about him. Well, I went out this one time, uh, taking the dog out and walking down the road. And this voice from 
way back, says, hello, good looking. <laughs> I heard it, but it was way back, and I thought, well, I'm not sure I want to turn around with that. And got a little closer. Hello, good looking. And I'm thinking, no, I, I don't want to be presumptuous in any way. I will not turn. <laughs> so I continue walking the dog, and I hear for the third time, but this time close up behind me, hello, good looking. And I could do nothing else but turn around. And here was this older lady with an older Labrador, completely transfixed on Jay, <laughs> my dog. I was devastated. But... <laughs> But, uh, but I was very happy for Jay, and, and he, uh, he got a lot of great comments that day, and uh, this uh, older lady and I, we, we would see each other from time to time after that and, uh, and chat about Labradors, and she was sorry about hers getting older, but uh, she just loved Jay. But... Um, that's not where I want to go particularly. It was just a funny story about Jay. But Jay, he was a very, um, what would I call it, nervous dog. I got the dog when he was almost a year old. And sometimes when we would walk, if there was another person coming towards us, particularly a man, Jay would start to cower. And he would start to get down on his legs a little bit. And then it got to the point where the person was almost up to us. He was almost crawling. And here's this big dog. And, and I, I was so embarrassed by this that more than a few times I had to explain to the passerby that, no, I didn't beat my dog or anything like that, um, but I had got this dog when he was a little older, and um, this was just how he was. It took quite a while, but uh, over a number of years, he settled down and, um, and began to be not so nervous, but always a little skittish, always a little skittish. When Paul writes to Timothy, he's saying, Timothy, we don't need to be like Jay. We don't need to cower. We don't need to crawl. We don't need to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power when it comes to the gospel. And he says, let that spirit rekindle the gift that you've been given and give you the power to get out there and put the gospel of life and immortality out there for others. And sometimes I, I wonder about the mainline churches. Because at times we seem to apologize for our faith. And at times we seem to hide it, keep it to ourselves. It becomes a private thing. But that's not, not what it was for Paul at all. This message of, of life and forgiveness and immortality was of such, such value and, and so great and exciting. He says, we have to keep going. We have to tell people. And he says to Timothy, he says to the church, God can give you the power to take that forward. And then he also says... God also gives the spirit of love. And it's amazing what happens when the love of God uh, enters a human heart because it can so deeply change a person, allow them to see others in a different light. But, but it's not always easy. I have a friend, uh, Frank, and he's been a, 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 a very good friend and a strong Christian for as long as I've known him. He's very involved in his church and um, has been supportive of the church on the board, on the property committee, goes to study groups, all that sort of thing. 
And uh, one day he was telling me about some problems that he was having in his church a while ago. It was with another person, another board member. And he explained that this board member, as far as he is aware, this was what happened, the board member presented an idea that was to establish some new programs within the church. And uh, it was a particular program that he wanted to see established. And uh, my friend Frank, he said, he, I wasn't opposed to the idea, but it wasn't something I wanted to get involved in. And the man took offense at this. And then he said that over time, this man sort of began to oppose him then on the board. And uh, he didn't stop. It went on. At one point, he accused Frank of being a racist. Uh, he started to speak ill of Frank to others, and he said there was this sort of small group within the board that then became a voting block, and anything the rest of us were trying to do, they would vote against it, and it just was causing a real rift. And he said, I've been wondering what to do. He says, I don't mind the guy, but I don't know what to do about this. And we talked about it, and he was talking about leaving the board, maybe leaving the church. And as we talked, we talked a little bit about Christian love and what that might mean. And just a few days ago, a friend of mine posted this on Facebook. I believe it's from a book by Tim Mannon entitled Doing Things That Matter. And this was the post. I'm not sure that we treat the great command like it's the greatest commandment. I have the conviction that if love isn't easy, we don't give it. Often we only offer our love when it doesn't require much effort. We love our families, our hobbies. We love donuts. We love things that are easy. But this world needs people who love in the face of disagreement, rejection, and even hatred. I wonder what would happen if we had an out-of-control type of love, one without conditions, fears, barriers, qualifiers, or protectors. What if we loved when it wasn't easy or convenient? What if we loved God and others recklessly? Recklessly. And Paul asks Timothy to rekindle his faith, to continue sharing this word about the cross and the resurrection. And he says, God didn't give us a spirit of cowardice, but he gave us a spirit of love. And that's a love for all. Even this person that was struggling with Frank. A love for people who are different, ungodly, as we might say, the entire community. And Paul's saying, this, this message is so important that it has to go out to all people. And God gives us the love that we need to share it with all, even when they oppose us, even when they're difficult. God gives us power. God gives us love. God gives us sophronismu. You haven't heard that word. It's Greek. And um, it's very difficult to translate. So many words uh, are difficult to translate from one language in, into another. But in our Bibles, most of the times these days, it gets translated self-discipline. But it's more than that. It can be translated moderation, good judgment, prudence, the wisdom that comes from prudence. I think I told you a while ago that I'd watched again what is now the old film, Sound of Music. And uh, perhaps you'll remember the beginning of the program of the film when Maria is up in the hills and 
She's up and she's singing and she's drifting around in the grass and enjoying the day. And then suddenly, the bell goes. The call to prayer. And there's no way she can get from the hills to the convent in the time that she has. Uh, but she sets off anyway and she runs down the hill and uh, the prayers, of course, come to an end and her absence is duly noted by all the senior nuns. And they start to sing this song. How do we solve a problem like Maria? You know that one? And they go on and on about this and uh, Maria's suitability for the novitiate. Well, many of the senior nuns, if you follow that song, they're trying to influence the senior person, the Reverend Mother, they're trying to get her to send her away. She's not suitable. She's disorganized. She's flighty. She's a headache. And uh, in the whole scene, you could just sense what we might call the sophronismo of the Reverend Mother. She hears the other nuns, she weighs the evidence, and in her decision, she's, she's not unduly influenced by naysayers. She doesn't do the political thing to appeal to all the other sort of leading sisters. Um, she's not tied to the rules. She looks for something that is just right for Maria. And of course, that sets the, the story up where she is asked to take a short sabbatical and discover herself at the home of Captain Von Trapp. And I think about that, and I think the Reverend Mother had sophronismo, the good judgment, the discipline in the midst of competing voices to have wisdom. And here it is. Timothy's, or Paul says, Timothy, you need to fan the embers of your faith, rekindle the gifts that are yours, be open to the Spirit, because we're not given a spirit of cowardice, but a spirit of power, of love, and sophronismo, that, that wisdom, that prudent wisdom that, that is smart about the task that God has given us. And here we have these words, these tools, these works of the, of the Holy Spirit. And they're at the forefront of, of Paul's words to Timothy and his hopes for the church. Apply it to today. I wonder about the church today. Because sometimes... I think we've become a little bit too soft. Cut off from our foundations. We've made ourselves, tried to make ourselves appealing to everyone, but made ourselves sort of innocuous and maybe bereft of value and of little consequence for many people in our society. In closing, there's a story about a woman who was the eldest person in a Midwestern town. And when she passed, the editor of the local newspaper decided that he would write up a little blurb about the oldest woman in the town who had just passed away. And he looked around and he tried to find some information about her and he couldn't find any. And he went into the pub nearby, and he asked. Nobody knew her. He went into the nightclub nearby. She hadn't danced there, even younger, as a young person. He went into the church. They didn't know her. He went to service groups. They didn't know her either. He asked people around the corner, and yeah, she'd come in for groceries, into the grocery store and that sort of thing, but they didn't know anything about her. Man's exasperated. So, being the editor, he says, I'll get someone else to do this. So, it was Monday afternoon. 
sports writer's not doing much on a Monday afternoon, so he gets the sports writer to, to take on this task. Sports writer goes uh, to look, and he can't find much about this woman either. And he looks here, and he looks there, and there's very little. And at the end of the day, he decides, well, I'll just put a few generalities about her. And he wrote up this column. The carver of the tombstone had little, other, little success finding out about her either, and so he borrowed from the words of the, the sports writer in the paper. And the tombstone read, Here lie the bones of Nancy Jones. For her, life had no terrors. She lived an old maid. She died an old maid. No hits, no runs, no errors. <laughs> How'd you like that on your stone? <laughs> But think about it. Has a church been like that in our generation? No hits, no runs, no errors. Much of the time we play it safe. Don't get out there. Don't live. Don't impress. Least of all the young people. And I'm almost wondering if people would, if we were back in the 19 teens, if somebody would give us a white feather. Or will we turn to the Spirit and ask God to re empower us 